This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the world. Get a whole month free at Mubi.com slash Eyebrow Cinema. Here are the 10 nominees for Best Motion Picture, Visual Effects, Achievement in Film Editing, Original Song, Adapted Screenplay. Here are the nominees for Achievement in Sound, Top Gun Maverick, 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 Tom Cruise, Christopher McQuarrie, David Ellison, and Jerry Bruckheimer producers. If you had told me at the beginning of 2022, that a belated legacy sequel to Top Gun would be among the year's most beloved Oscar darlings, I'm not sure I would have believed you. But then again, a lot of Top Gun Maverick's success has been incredulous. In an era where even the biggest movies make the bulk of their money on opening weekend, before dropping precipitously and shuffling over to the small screen, Maverick held steady lasting in theaters for over five months. Long after its debut in May, the film still drew healthy crowds, sticking in the top 10 highest grocers 21 weeks after release. Just anecdotally, I didn't get around to seeing Maverick until late September, on a lazy Sunday afternoon, and it was still the most people I'd seen in a multiplex in months. In an era where superheroes and children's movies dominate the box office, Top Gun Maverick stood tall for most of 2022 as the highest grossing film of the year. It wasn't until Avatar The Way of Water that Maverick was dethroned, and even that's only at the worldwide box office. Domestically, Top Gun is still number one. But Maverick's success is about more than just money, and it's also about more than the volume of positive reviews from critics. It's the tone of those reviews. Top Gun Maverick has been praised, not just as a fun bit of summer entertainment, but as the savior of blockbuster cinema, an antidote to the inert spectacles offered by the likes of Disney, and a return to when summer movies could be genuinely thrilling. Pete Maverick Mitchell may be a hero of the skies, but Tom Cruise is a hero of the cinema. This is a reading the film actively courts. As Rear Admiral Chester Kane chews out Maverick's fighter pilot antics, antiquated in an era of drone warfare, the subtext is really about Tom Cruise's own relevancy. How vital are movie stars, practical stunts, and theatrical exhibition in an era of franchises, CGI, and home streaming? The old ways are headed for extinction. Thank Maybe so, so sir. sir. But not today. today. In the face of oblivion, Maverick and Tom Cruise, both men essentially one and the same, remain steadfast in their principles, ultimately triumphing because of their seemingly archaic qualities, not in spite of them. Just as Maverick defeats the villains with an obsolete plane, Cruise bested his summer movie competition through adherence to his old school convictions. Even withholding the film years after its completion so it could play in theaters, rather than released to streaming at the height of the pandemic. That gambit paid off, in billions of dollars, in critical raves, in pundits imploring the Academy honor the film with a Best Picture nomination, and indeed, with a half dozen Oscar nominations. Yet for all these quantifiable metrics of success, I think the best indicator of Maverick's reception is the simple, pointed description which has shadowed the film since its release. It feels like a real movie. What's bewildering is when you remember all this lavish, near-religious-like awe is for a sequel to Top Gun, a movie that in 1986 seemed the embodiment of everything wrong with Hollywood. The original film was part of a trend in high-concept blockbusters, Films which didn't tell a story so much as they did a premise, and in the case of Top Gun, a rather thin premise at that. What if Tom Cruise went to pilot school and was the best of the best? Every narrative development is designed to confirm the hero's own innate awesomeness, a power fantasy all the more odious given the film an unofficial piece of Navy propaganda. The film's slick, 
hyper-real visual style only enriches the fantasy, with even mundane locations like classrooms bathed in high-contrast lighting, bodies glistening with sweat, every frame luxuriating in sensational images. Top Gun and movies like it were, in Mark Harris's words, rails of celluloid cocaine, and their popularity helped sound the death knell for the moody, morally complex, character-driven cinema of the 1970s. That what was once a harbinger of doom has become, in 2022, a ray of hope is itself telling about the desperate state of contemporary Hollywood cinema. But lest I commit myself too fully as a hater, I should take a step back and say that I do like Top Gun Maverick. In a lot of respects, it's a hard movie to dislike, so careful in its design to thrive as an uninhibited crowd-pleaser. Tom Cruise's love of aviation and his adherence to practical filmmaking results in far more viscerally impactful set pieces. To see the genuine effects of G-Force weigh down on an actor who is really in the cockpit of a fighter jet blasting through the skies is palpably thrilling. And this is combined with a general sense of action movie fundamentals. Each action scene is careful to establish what the threat is, build tension, and then release it in a glorious burst of heavy machinery and daredevil antics. Beyond its action, though, Maverick is also a rather complete movie-going experience, balancing high-tech aerial battles with fraught character drama, a light romance, and a splash of humor, which gets its laughs, but never at the expense of the film's drama. There is an unabashed sincerity to Top Gun Maverick. The film takes its characters and world completely seriously, willing to sit in the low points so that latter triumphs are all the more resonant. A lot of this comes down to Tom Cruise, who remains a movie star with effortless grace, but it's also found in the supporting cast, stacked to the brim with talent and charisma. In a couple of places, Maverick even improves upon the original Top Gun. For one, Maverick himself has mellowed with age, and this more humbled, more gracious version of the character is a lot more appealing to me than the cocksure brat we met in 1986. More significantly though, the climactic mission is not just a random plot development to give the heroes something to blow up at the end, but essentially the premise of the movie. Maverick's whole reason for returning to Top Gun is to train a new batch of pilots to undertake a dangerous trench run. Not only does this give the sequel a much stronger sense of narrative drive, it also allows the film to prepare the audience for the climax, just as it does the pilots. Scene after scene communicates in both dialogue and visuals what to expect in the finale, so that when we get there, the movie can move forward at ferocious speed without ever sacrificing clarity. Top Gun Maverick is a good movie, and I would not argue against that. But a great movie? This is where I start to bristle. For a start, a lot of why the movie's structure is so successful is because it's highly derivative. In typical legacy sequel fashion, Maverick hits the exact same plot beats as its predecessor, and also in typical legacy sequel fashion, actively flaunts this repetition rather than try to hide it. Beyond just copying the original film though, Maverick's screenplay is just more generally a wash in cliché. Every character is a stock stereotype. The rookie with a chip on his shoulders, the reluctant mentor, the old flame, the arrogant rival, the hard ass, and all of their arcs pay off in the exact way you'd expect them to. It works, sure, but it works because it's safe. Then there's the film's geopolitical implications, Maverick careful to never explicitly name or even imply who the enemy is, lest we should think about the ethics and implications of America blowing them to smithereens. Speaking of politics, Top Gun's legacy as unofficial propaganda remains intact. Much as Maverick may be a metaphor for blockbuster filmmaking, it is also literally about the supremacy of American military and a celebration of their fun toys. 
The inciting incident is practically sponsored by weapons developer Lockheed Martin, responsible for selling weapons to the Department of Defense and the makers of Maverick's sexy new plane. Can't say I particularly love that. And while I did praise Maverick's screenplay improvements over the first movie, I don't think the sequel matches the original Top Gun's aesthetic strides. For one, the soundtrack doesn't even come close. No disrespect to Lady Gaga, but Hold My Hand is not a particularly memorable tune. Certainly not an earworm like Danger Zone or Take My Breath Away. One Republic's I Ain't Worried has a nice affability which effectively scores the beach football game, but does it match Kenny Loggins' plan with the boys and the unadulterated homoerotic display of masculinity from the first movie? I should say not. Visually, Maverick certainly fares better, but it still falls short of the sheer intensity and maximalist spectacle of the late Tony Scott. To crib a line from my friend the movie vampire on Letterboxd, whether one considers it a good thing for Hollywood movies to be filmed like Gillette commercials is a matter of taste, but there's no denying Scott developed a slick and influential style for shooting blockbuster spectacles. The emphasis on pleasure, wherein every frame is designed to be as sexy and as exciting as possible, may well be shallow, but it certainly lends itself to some sensational imagery. Joseph Kaczynski does his best to replicate that style, even recreating specific images. But Maverick lacks the physical, near carnal quality of the original. The images are a bit too crisp and clean. Now to be clear, this is a matter of degrees. Top Gun Maverick is, on the whole, a very nice looking movie, with a good sense of scale and excitement. But when compared to Tony Scott's innovations, Kaczynski is clearly a follower. And while Tom Cruise certainly holds the film together with movie star bravado, I must say, I miss when Cruise used to really stretch himself as an actor, teaming with auteur filmmakers who did challenging or subversive things with his star persona. I think about all the work and strenuous training that went into bringing Top Gun Maverick to the screen, all for a character that interests me infinitely less than Les Grossman. In sum, I think it would be fair to say I find Top Gun Maverick overrated. But my goal with this video is not to argue that actually Top Gun Maverick sucks and you're dumb if you like it. For one, I like the movie too, but also because I'm more interested in understanding Maverick's reception than I am proving it wrong. Because I don't think my criticisms of the movie are particularly mind-blowing insights. A lot of the film's champions will in fact acknowledge the same shortcomings I have. Its derivativeness, shallow screenplay, shameless propaganda, and celebrate the whole all the same. That might simply reflect a belief that the film's many strengths more than compensate for its weaknesses. But I think it also offers a glimpse into the current standards for blockbuster filmmaking and the contemporary cinematic culture writ large. Maverick's success is as much a reflection of the context in which it was released as it is the qualities of the film itself. What might account for that success, and what are its implications? Well, for starters, I feel it necessary to debunk one key theory that's been floating online for the past several months, that Top Gun Maverick was a hit because it was anti-woke. A coalition of reactionary YouTubers have certainly put forth that take, and the film has also been claimed by Fox News, who attacked the snooty film critics of the New York Times for failing to acknowledge America's real favorite movie of 2022 in their best of lists. This argument is ultimately pretty flimsy though. Despite right-wing efforts to claim Maverick, many of the film's most vocal admirers are people who would broadly be labeled as progressives. The film is also more or less on par when it comes to diversity and inclusion in modern franchise films. The opening text explaining fighter pilot school has been altered from the original to include women. And indeed, the students include women and people of color. Black actors Charles Purnell and Bashir Salahuddin have key supporting roles, playing characters in positions of authority. The dialogue is no longer tinged with casual sexism, and, rather significantly, 
Maverick does not humble his female superior through his sheer sexual magnetism anymore. This all tracks with the minimal representation gains and diffused sexism seen in the supposedly woke offerings from the rest of Hollywood. And frankly, much as the get woke, go broke crowd might not like to hear it, you don't become a billion dollar grossing phenomenon on the backs of terminally online anti-SJWs. I can certainly believe that some audience members did indeed respond to seeing a straight white man as the hero, but to seriously suggest anti-wokeness played any substantial role in Top Gun Maverick's cultural, critical, or financial success is laughable. More convincing is Maverick's success as an antidote to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the wake of both the horrors of the virus itself and the isolation of lockdown, there has been a yearning for a big, old-fashioned bit of Hollywood escapism to whisk us away and deliver some big screen excitement. A yearning that long went unmet. Tenet was the first attempt, but opening so early in the pandemic, before we even had a vaccine, meant that release was always going to be touched with anxiety. Even if it wasn't also Christopher Nolan's most obtuse and least emotionally involving movie yet. Other contenders would make their claim. No Time to Die certainly had its moments, but it also concluded the already brooding and maudlin Daniel Craig cycle of 007 movies with James Bond's death. Ghostbusters Afterlife? The film that bravely asked, what if we made a Ghostbusters movie without jokes? Free Guy? A film whose plastic and phony visual style and snarky sense of humor Top Gun serves as direct rebuttal to? The Matrix Resurrections? Awesome movie, one of my favorites of its year in fact, but Lana Wachowski's deliberate denial of easy fan service is essentially an exercise in anti-crowd pleasing. Dune, the Batman? Also great, and certainly successful with critics and audiences, but I wouldn't say their dark atmosphere and aesthetics were aspiring to breezy fun. Fast 9? Definitely gets closer, and I'd even argue it an improvement over the last few movies. But the series has become so burdened by excess characters and soap opera storytelling that jumping in without a fan wiki's worth of franchise memory is about as welcoming as going in blind to the MCU. And here at last, we arrive at the elephant in the room, the superhero industrial complex that has continued to occupy North American cinemas throughout the last decade. What about them? Marvel in particular, with their emphasis on breezy entertainments, would seem poised to deliver exactly the kind of unpretentious escapism so needed in the pandemic. And to their credit, they've certainly tried, but releasing seven movies, eight seasons of television, and two streaming specials in just two years have also diluted the brand. Even if you loved all these pieces of, I shudder to say it, content, You'd be hard-pressed to argue new MCU feels special anymore, and evidence suggests that the love is in fact dwindling. It would be overstating things to say Marvel is in their flop era, No Way Home gross more domestically than the next four highest grossers of that year combined, but the movies of Phase 4 have been getting larger and louder negative reactions. The MCU may still lead at the box office, but with the exception of No Way Home, the films have shown a notable decline from their predecessors. A study commissioned last year by Variety reported that, quote, one third of Marvel fans feel fatigued from the constant stream of content served in theaters and on Disney+. I'm not sure how much I believe that, especially given two of Phase 4's biggest hits were the movie's most awash in shared universe baggage. But taken in tandem with the critical backlash and the declining box office numbers, I think it is fair to say that a shroud of disappointment has circled Marvel over the last two years. In this context, the rapturous response to Top Gun Maverick from critics and audiences starts to make a lot of sense. When our cinematic amphetamines are about as potent as Flintstone's vitamins, a bit of celluloid cocaine is quite the treat. I suspect the cult fever for Tollywood epic RRR comes from a similar place, a reminder that blockbuster entertainments can actually be fun. 
And escapism isn't just found in Maverick's practical action filmmaking or high-octane spectacle, but the feel-good sentiment at the heart of the story. The climax and epilogue of the movie are pure positivity, designed to leave you smiling as you walk out the theater. And that quality is also key to the film's many Oscar nominations. The articles which argued for Maverick's Best Picture nomination were defined by populist rhetoric. That if the arty snobs of the Academy would only come off their high horse and open their hearts, they'd see how beloved Top Gun is. The rap sums up this position best, writing, After all, this is the same group of snooty cinephiles who gave 2021's Best Picture Award to Nomadland, the film in which Francis McDormand poops into a bucket. Thing is, Nomadland is actually pretty atypical as far as Best Picture winners go. Historically, the Academy has largely honored popular, crowd-pleasing entertainments with their top prize, often at the expense of the more formally adventurous or narratively challenging. This precedent was set at the very first Oscars, where the cutting edge and emotionally demanding Sunrise was recognized for its unique artistic achievement, but the inaugural Best Picture was awarded to Wings, an action movie and romance about a fighter pilot. Hmm, sounds familiar. The Best Picture winners in the decades to follow would show all manner of variation, but generally skewed towards populist, crowd-pleasing hits. Sometimes that populism would cross over with genuine artistic achievement, but this was by no means a prerequisite. And to be sure, there are exceptions, moments where the Academy has honored the thematically complex and aesthetically adventurous. But more often than not, the dark, fraught, and challenging have found defeat at the hands of feel-good sentiment. So while Top Gun Maverick might, on its surface, seem a million miles removed from Oscar bait, its features are consistent with the kinds of movie that win Best Picture. Made for adults but not complex, dramatically resonant but not emotionally draining, Maverick is the kind of populist hit that's in short supply in 2022. Which is not to say adult-oriented entertainments don't get made by Hollywood anymore. The last year alone offered several high-quality Hollywood movies for grown-ups, many of which are competing with Top Gun for Best Picture. These sorts of movies do still get made. They just don't make any money. Outside of Elvis, and to a lesser extent The Woman King, the adult dramas of 2022 have all struggled to find a foothold at the domestic box office. You might think that prestige dramas anchoring for Oscar nominations have always made a relative pittance, but that isn't true. The chasm between the year's highest grossing movies and the Best Picture nominations has been growing since the 80s, but even as late as 2010, a movie like The King's Speech could still gross $140 million domestically and almost half a billion worldwide. Hell, in 2005, Best Picture nominee Munich was considered a defiantly non-commercial project for Steven Spielberg and a box office disappointment, and it still grossed 30 million more than charming and fun coming-of-age story The Fablemans. As theatrical exhibition has become more and more hostile to movies for grown-ups, and more accommodating to adolescent entertainments, Oscar movies have become lesser hits. I don't mean to suggest that box office is the be-all and end-all, but I do think the declining profitability of an adult cinema is relevant to Top Gun Maverick's Oscar nominations. Granted, calling Top Gun Maverick a movie for adults is somewhat misleading. The film is a simplistic power fantasy after all, and not much more mature than your average superhero movie. But in foregrounding an older protagonist, acknowledging his age, and featuring more traditional action rather than the fantastical, Maverick does appeal to an older audience. But unlike most of the adult-oriented movies in 2022, the audience actually showed up. Despite being a sequel to what is essentially a teen movie, Top Gun Maverick emerged as a throwback to when an action drama for grown-ups could penetrate the mainstream 
all the more special after a decade of children's entertainment throttling the box office. And that brings me to the final relevant context for Maverick's success. We're drowning in nonsense. I don't mean comic book movies or endless IP ringing, though that is often how said nonsense manifests. I'm talking about something more pervasive at the heart of big budget movie making. How many recent screenplays have been a jumbled mess of half-baked ideas, lacking in setup or connective tissue? How many action spectacles have had their action defined by storyboard and effects artists, full of individual gags, but without narrative or aesthetic cohesion with the rest of the movie? How many productions have spent hundreds of millions on actors and special effects, while skimping on the basics of editing and scene construction? How many blockbusters have assumed their spectacle a given, and filmed their big scenes with all the cinematic ingenuity of an SNL sketch? How many irony poison movies have deflected potential criticisms of cliché or sentimentality with sarcastic quips? You can't story. be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man if there's no neighborhood. Okay, that didn't really make sense, but you know what I'm trying to say. Top Gun Maverick's story may be formulaic and unchallenging, but at least it has a tightly structured and thought-out screenplay. Top Gun Maverick might not have the gumption to think critically about its geopolitics, lest it interfere with the action spectacle. But at least that spectacle is made with a real sense of craft and excitement woven into the movie rather than just placed into it. Top Gun Maverick may not match the visual creativity of Tony Scott, but at least it understands that grandiose visuals are vital to the blockbuster. Top Gun Maverick may be riddled with cliches, but at least it hits those cliches with conviction. Top Gun Maverick may not be a great movie, but at least it's a real movie. Right now, Apparently that's enough. When the only movies that can make major gains in theaters are the ones offering spectacle, and many of those spectacles are so fundamentally shoddy and insubstantial, I can understand why Top Gun Maverick seems positively dignified by comparison. For all my complaints with the film, I'm less disappointed in Maverick itself than I am the notion that a movie like this is such a rarity. A big-budget action movie with ambitious set pieces, visual excitement, and a workable screenplay is nothing to sneeze at, but it isn't an unmitigated triumph either. Or at least, it shouldn't be. Top Gun Maverick is not the best movie of the year, but it is the most revealing. Though I gotta say, if any Academy members are watching this, don't vote for Top Gun Maverick as best picture. Vote for Tar. Thank you to MUBI for sponsoring this video. MUBI is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the world. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. And these movies don't come from a faceless algorithm, but are hand-picked by actual human beings. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. I talked a lot about the films of 2022 today, and if you want to see one of the best, you've got to see Decision to Leave. Park Chan-wook's latest film is a Hitchcockian-flavored thriller told with complete mastery of cinematic style, a sly sense of humor, and that touch of the perverse that has made Park so alluring. It's the kind of detective story you don't want spoiled for you. But don't worry, you can watch Decision to Leave and a whole host of amazing cinema for free right now. Just head to movie.com slash eyebrowcinema for a free 30 days. That's a whole month of great cinema for free.